so yes, today we're gonna talk about climate change and in the Alps and how it can affect sociality in uh, cooperative breeding species, which is the alpine mammoth. So you all know that climate is changing. It's even raining when you come to Barcelona, so it's <laughs> completely not normal. But this has uh, quite a lot. Uh, one of the main effects is this uh, enormous uh, raise in temperature and very, very fast rise in temperature. But there is also lots of other um, change in environmental variables that are associated with climate change. And we will see that in the Alps, of course, we see this huge increase in temperature, but it also has other consequences. And the thing with climate change is that since uh, several decades now, there is lots, lots of study reporting different effects on different species that can go from uh, change in phenology, change in uh, distribution of uh, species or change in demography. But what is really difficult to uh, do is to predict uh, what a species will do when she faces climate change and what will be the magnitude of this effect. And one way to try to be better in predicting the effect of climate change is to try to understand the mechanisms that are uh, under underlying this effect that we see. And uh, climate change actually uh, could affect uh, the demographic response of uh, a species through a different way. Uh, the usual way that we think about is uh, the direct effect. So for example, uh, for example, a temperature effect directly on survival or snow effect directly on survival. But it has also very strong effect through the uh, effect that the climate can have on the productivity of plants and then for mammals or birds on the resources that are available for these species which in turn will have some uh, effect on the demographic response. So, uh, so to say, we have some direct effect, but we also have some indirect effect through uh, resources, for example. Uh, one uh, question that we have as a, a mammal people, or uh, not only mammal, but uh, people working on uh, species that are a bit higher on the on the food uh, chain is whether like some very specific uh, characteristic of the species and especially its lifestyle will affect the response that the species will have uh, to climate change. And in this lifestyle uh, ID, you have several characteristics of a species that are encompassed, like for example, um, the sociality of a species, whether a species is living alone or is living with other conspecific most of the time, uh, the way they reproduce, whether they are monogamous or polygynous, or uh, some specific uh, feature of their life cycle, for example, hibernation. And we know from uh, both empirical um, studies and theoretical studies that, for example, species that have uh, long, uh, long life, long-lived species, uh, should be uh, more affected by climate change than the ones that have short life. And today we're going to look at uh, one uh, sp species, my favorite one, the alpine marmots. Uh, why are we interested in the alpine marmots, apart from the fact that I'm following them since 15 years, so they are a bit like friends, is that uh, the Alps and all uh, ecosystems in altitude or high in, uh, altitude, uh, in latitude also are especially sensitive to climate change are, and are the ones that are the most affected and the most fastly affected at the moment. And what we can see uh, in our study size, so this is data that uh, we have uh, in, uh, in the study where I work in the Alps, quite high because the study size is above 2,000 meters above sea level. So uh, is that we have uh, the winter has changed quite a lot. And in recent year, we have more dry and cold winter than uh, in the 90s, where we had more wet and uh, mild with, uh, winter. So uh, by wet uh, or dry, we uh, talk mainly about uh, snow, amount of snow that fall uh, during the winter. So less snow and uh, here we have less snow and colder winter than we had previously. 
Uh, the other thing is that it seems that the, um, the spring is uh, more and more early. Also, you see that uh, we have very strong effect uh, regarding the winter climatic variable, but it's way less sensitive in the spring. So the spring tends to be a bit earlier, but it's very uh, less marked, and this relation is barely significant. It's just uh, above uh, the p-value is around 0.04. Seven, so it's not yet significant. Uh, when we look at the marmots, uh, you can think, oh, this is the perfect species to fit this kind of harsh climate that you can have in the Alps. And this is some picture of a uh, horse to decide, so you can see that we have snow most of the year and we can have quite a lot of snow, and it's mostly a, co a cold place. And if we look at the marmots, what could make the marmots a species so well adapted uh, to uh, the harsh condition is first the social structure that this species has. So the marmots are living in family groups. Uh, in a family group, you have a pair of dominant, those two guys, one male, one female. You have some subordinates. So the subordinates are all individuals. Uh, in the groups that will be one year or older and they can be of the two sexes, males or females and they stay in their family group way beyond their sexual maturity. And uh, you have the pups of the year, the, the small ones, and the pups you can have from one to seven pups. They only reproduce once annually and those guys, the subordinates here, they play a role in uh, raising these pups. So uh, the guys here, uh, they are usually at least related to one of the dominant, the female or the males, and most of the time they are related to the two actually. So they are previous uh, pups from uh, the dominants. And uh, if we look at the life cycle of the marmots, uh, especially at its annual cycle, it's a very uh, special life cycle, which is marked by two big periods. So the first one is uh, the active period, which takes place from beginning of April to mid-October, and then come a long hibernation period. So if you look at the active period, it's very short active periods and within this time the marmot has to do a lot of stuff. So the first thing that they do is get out from hibernation and as soon as they will emerge above ground the first thing that they will do even before starting to eat is to mate. And uh, once they have mate uh, the female will be pregnant for around 30 days then they will give birth to this very, very cute pink creature. Huh? So, and uh, those guys obviously will stay in the burrow because it will be kind of uh, not really make sense to go out when you are in this kind of condition. And they will stay in the burrow for 40 days. And during this time, uh, their mother will lactate them. And uh, we do think that probably other individuals also take care of the pups at that moment. After the 40 days, uh, the awful little pink creature become these really cute hairy guys and they are wind and they go out above ground. And this happens around uh, the last week of Ju June to the two first week of July in our population. And then uh, everybody, the pups especially, will try to grow as much as possible and to put as much fat as possible to uh, start hibernating. And they will start the hibernation around mid-October. And they uh, do something quite special, which is called uh, social uh, hibernation. All individuals of the same family will hibernate together in the same burrow and they do this kind of very uh, big pile of marmots. And then they sleep for quite a long uh, until they will emerge again on the next uh, April, uh, usually in uh, not so good condition. So uh, the adults lose around 30% of their weight during uh, hibernation. 
Und äh, de, so there are several features of the sociality of marmots. Uh, of course, there is the abuse things that we think about, which is anti-predator alarm call, but it's not the main part of uh, sociality in marmots. The main part is really that they are social hibernators and that during hibernation, the male, um, they have a very specific behavior. So the, uh, and this is why they are called helpers. Uh, during their hibernation, the subordinate males, um, they will wake up during all the euthermic phases. So uh, they are, during hibernation, they wake up around 15 times. Uh, so to put their metabolism back in order and get rid of the metabolism trash and all this kind of stuff. And the helpers and the dominant male will always wake up before the other individual of the groups. And by uh, waking up before the other, they uh, raise the temperature of uh, the burrow. And this raising in temperature allow especially the pups to consume less energy to reach this thermic phase. And when you see, uh, when you look at this effect of this very special uh, behavior, which is called social thermoregulation, uh, when you have helpers, as you see, uh, the number of helpers is, ra is raising, then the survival of the pups will also rise by quite a lot. So it's quite an effective uh, helping done by those guys. And uh, we were interested in how uh, climate change will affect uh, the sociality of uh, the marmots and their demographic performances. And given the life cycle of uh, the marmots, uh, there is two uh, phases that are especially important. Obviously, the winter and the hibernation period, which is a huge bottleneck in terms of energy, and uh, the spring. So um, what we saw in the Alps is that we have a decrease, a huge decrease in so snow cover and an increase in temperature. So uh, we were interested in the direct effect that those climatic variables could have on different um, uh, traits, first body mass, and also on uh, two fitness traits, which are reproduction and survival. And then we were interested in integrating the potential uh, modification of both reproduction and survival into uh, the demography of the population. But we were also very interested in how those uh, climatic variables could affect the social environment and uh, marmots are experiencing and how this uh, social environment will in turn affect the performance of the marmots and the demography of the population. So uh, we look at uh, both uh, snow cover and uh, temperature and we look at both the winter period and the spring period which are the two critical periods in the life uh, cycle of the marmot. We also uh, look at more variables in the summer, but I will not talk about them today because they mainly have no effects. So uh, we look at the winter uh, condition, which uh, will reflect what the marmots face during hibernation and uh, are some kind of indirect uh, measure of the energy that they will uh, uh, spend during this period and uh, we were interested in spring and summer because obviously this drive the, availabil the availability of resources that the marmot will benefit of. And we use several variables so quickly uh, for the summer we look at uh, the productivity of plant and we use uh, one index which uh, give you how, whether the vegetation is good or mainly dry, which happened very quickly in the Alps in summer. And uh, we look at the winter. So the winter, we use uh, two variables, the snow cover and the temperature during winter. And to uh, characterize the spring, we use the NDVI, which in the Alps is a good uh, measure of uh, the snow melt and the onset of vegetation. So we were hoping to have 
positive effect on all the different variables, whether phenotypic trait or a fitness trait of the spring, because due to climate change, we expect spring to be earlier and then marmots to benefit of more resources earlier in the spring when it's really critical for them. And uh, we were uh, expecting that the uh, winter condition uh, will have some negative effect on all these threats. Why? Because uh, the marmots, uh, when they are in their bureau, they uh, are very sensitive to the temperature of the hibernacula, and this temperature is dependent on the snow cover that you have above uh, ground, which is like kind of uh, a roof that protects the marmot from the cold. And we uh, did all that in uh, a population that we follow in the French Alps. So it's situated here, very close to the Vanoise National Park and the border of uh, Italy. It's, uh, so the, this is our site here, mainly. It's kind of a glacier valley. And uh, it's 2,340 2, meters above sea level exactly. And since uh, the 90s, we uh, are following 24 to 30 groups. So this is those guys that live here. And as you see, it's kind of packed with marmots. And all these little things are different territory. And you see that you have no free space. Everything is occupied. Uh, what uh, were we doing every summer in this population? So we uh, conduct a capture macro capture protocol to follow uh, all the life history of the marmots. And we also uh, do a lot of sampling, different kind of sampling. So the marmots go through different measurements, obviously body mass plus other biometric measure. We also collect a bunch of sample, genetic sample to know who is the father of who and who is the mother of who. And also some uh, physiological measurement that I will not talk about today, but that we also do. And those guys compressing Mariona, which is here, <laughs> spend a lot of time watching the marmots to uh, know the exact composition of the groups. And also to record when exactly the pups go out, how much pups go out, and all this kind of very useful information. So every day we are doing that uh, on around 200 marmots, which over the course of the study makes uh, more than 1,600 marmots that we follow for at least quite a bunch of their life. And so we, as regard to the data that we will use today, we need the group composition. Since we have subordinate and dominant, and that will obviously affect their survival, you need the social status of those guys. We have the number of subordinates, the size of the groups. We have individual measure, especially body mass and genotype. And we have a very detailed data on the reproduction. So we have the litter size, the juvenile survival, and the date of emergence, and of course the body mass of those guys. The first thing that we look at is uh, how um, the body mass of the mother uh, change over the course of the study, since in mammals the body mass is a critical determinant of the litter size. And what we saw is that uh, since uh, 96, uh, we had a decrease of the body weight of the female marmots, and the one that uh, raised pups. And over this period, they lose around 20 grams per year. So, um, yeah, so um, some stuff disappears uh, with the PDF, uh, but okay. So, what is uh, the body mass is decreasing over the uh, 90, since the 90s, and uh, the litter size, as expected from this decrease in body mass, is also decreasing quite a lot. And since uh, the beginning of the study, so the 90s and until 2010, the litter size lose around one pups in average. So when we start the study, on average we had 4.5 pups per litter, and 
Nowadays, we have around 3.5 bus per liter. And uh, we look then at what can be the determinant of uh, this lister size. And what we found is that the snow depth is a very strong determinant of lister size, which explains 30, around 30% 30 of the variability in lister size in all population. So the higher is the snow depth during the winter, the more pups you will have the next spring. The other variable that was really important but still a bit less than the winter snow depths, is the, uh, the end of the winter. So if the winter end early and the vegetation onset is early, we also have more pups than in the year where you have a late uh, snow melt and a late vegetation onset. But clearly, uh, the most important at the moment is this effect of uh, the winter snow depths, which is uh, a bit uh, explaining more variability than the early snow melt. And if we look at uh, the decrease in uh, litter size, so here you have in red uh, the, the litter size, and you can see that it just decreases all the time. And the decrease in litter size is very well correlated with the uh, change in the snow depth. So if you have a lot of snow, you have a lot of uh, pups. If you have uh, few snow, you also have few pups. So uh, looking at the litter size, what is clear is that we have a small positive effect of earlier snow melt, uh, actually, but we have a very strong negative effect of um, the change in the winter and especially the change in the snow depths during winter. And that leads to the decrease in the litter size we observe in the population. The other uh, variable that we were interested in was the juvenile survival. And when we look at the juvenile survival, we also have quite a strong decrease in juvenile survival. So the probability to survive if you are a pup were, was about 0 0.8 in the 90s. But no, uh, if you are born in uh, 2010, your chance to survive is only uh, 1 over 2. And what we uh, found looking at the juvenile survival is that you have two very strong determinants of uh, juvenile survival. The first one is the climatic condition. So uh, clearly uh, being born in a dry and cold winter is uh, worse than being born in the wet and, wild and mild uh, winter. But this effect of climate is strongly affected by the composition of your family. And if you have uh, if you were born in uh, families with a lot of helpers, then you, your survival is not so much affected by the climatic condition that you face. But if you are born in a family with very few helpers, then you have uh, a huge difference uh, regarding the climate effect. So if you have few helpers, then you have very, very low chance to survive a dry and cold winter and you have way higher chance to survive a wet and mild wet winter. So it seems quite clear that uh, you are, the social environment that you are facing can buffer some of the climatic effect. And uh, for now, uh, whatever happens is that globally we have a decrease in juvenile survival. And why do we have such a uh, decrease in juvenile survival? Uh, for, uh, um, due to actually indirect effect of climate on, the, on uh, juvenile survival. And this un uh, indirect effect goes through a modification of the social structure. So if we look at the uh, condition in the, in the winter, uh, two years before those guys are born, uh, we have uh, an effect on the number of helpers that we have. So over the, um, in between the 90s and 2010, we have a very, very strong decrease in the proportion of family that do have helpers in this population. 
And the strong uh, effect of uh, the strong decrease in the number of and the proportion of helpers we have uh, in the families is due to both a decrease in the number of puffs that are produced and a decrease in the number uh, of puffs that do survive. So if one year you have pups that are born in a very uh, bad climatic condition, you have few pups born and you have few pups that survive. These guys, two years later, are supposed to become the helpers in the family. and They are few, and so you have few helpers. And having few helpers uh, make affect, in turn, the survival of the young that are produced. So you have this mild winter that uh, at birth and that will decrease the number of helpers and in turn this decrease in the number of helpers will affect the juvenile survival. So if we uh, look at uh, a summary of what we have found is that okay we have a little nice effect of the having earlier spring uh, on litter size. But this is far from being compensated by very uh, bad effect of the winter condition on both litter size and juvenile survival. And this effect on litter size and juvenile survival has a bad effect on the number of helpers, so a decrease in the number of helpers. And this decrease of the number of helpers in turn reaffect negatively the litter size and the juvenile survival. And if we put all that in demographic model, we do find that uh, actually uh, the growth rate of the population has uh, decreased below one. So the population is not anymore uh, growing and it's even decreasing. So uh, if we come back to our initial question, is the lifestyle important? Obviously, in the marmots, uh, one of the critical features of their uh, life cycle, which is the uh, hibernation, is a very critical period for them in terms of their demographic performance. And uh, what is clear is that the climatic uh, condition that we are facing during winter at the moment has uh, a very huge impact on uh, the population demography and it actually causes a decline in, on, in this population. We were quite surprised by uh, this result because we uh, had been drawing uh, our study on, uh, in comparison to uh, another population of marmots, which is the yellow-bellied marmots. So the yellow-bellied marmots are these uh, very lucky guys that are living in the Colorado. And uh, if we look at the performance of these guys in the actual uh, change of climate, they do well and they do very well actually. The population was growing and everything, so we were hoping that for the marmots was the same, because from uh, looking at those guys, uh, they found that, okay, the winter there is less snow, but the spring is really good. So the spring is earlier, and this is good for marmots, at least for those guys, because for all guys, it's not enough. And if we look at uh, the performances of the, the two species, uh, the yellow bellied, they grow in mass, actually. Uh, the winning date is earlier and earlier, so the pups get out of the ground earlier than before, and the population size is also growing. And by comparison, what we found with uh, the alpine marmot is that their body mass is decreasing, the winning date has not changed, and uh, the population size is declining. So we were wondering uh, what's going on. If we look at uh, the yellow bellied, uh, we uh, we it seems that the winter effect is very low on those populations, and the change in winter had no effect on the performance of uh, the species. But the spring has a huge impact and a huge positive impact, which results in growing population. While us, we have a very strong effect of winter, and this is a very strong negative effect. We have a small effect, a smaller effect of spring, and this, is, and this is 
effect is uh, positive, but not enough to compensate the bad effect of winter. And this leads to a uh, population that is decreasing in size. Okay, that's for the big picture, but now the devils is always on the details. So if we look at what's going on in the ro Rocky Mountains, you know, Rockies are fav very famous place for skiing. Why? Because those guys benefit from four meters of snow per year. This is good, and maybe the marmots now have 50 centimeters less snow on their head, but it probably doesn't matter much. In the Alps, we only have one to two meters of snow. Second, uh, those guys seem to be super efficient hibernators. When uh, uh, an alpine marmot is losing around 8 grams per day of hibernation, those guys only lose around 2 grams per day of uh, uh, hibernation. They, uh, they are, if you look at the overall performance during hibernation, the yellow bellied managed to, to save 83% of their energy doing uh, hibernating, while our marmots only save 44%. And uh, those guys do that without having to bother to uh, their fellow, because actually they hibernate alone, why the marmots need to hibernate in family. And when I say they need to, they really need to. A marmot that is hibernating alone, she has 2% chance to see the next spring. So barely nothing. So what it seems is that uh, in the Rockies, you have very better insulation of the burrow during winter. And on the top of that, we have, you have a better energetic balance during hibernation. And if we uh, look a bit uh, uh, at this question, but from an interspecific uh, perspective, we saw that if you uh, put climate on a scale of harshness, and you look at the marmots on the scale of sociality. So here you have low harshness and huge harshness of clima climate. And here you have a low uh, sociality gradient and a high sociality. sociality. You have the solar, 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 solar woodchuck, which is here, and which is actually doing quite fine in regarding uh, climate. Actually, it can even colonize everywhere from nearly Florida to the top up of Canada. You have those guys in the middle, that seems to be quite okay now. And we have the marmots, which is obviously the most uh, social of all these species, that is kind of facing a uh, difficult time. And uh, this is also related to the way uh, they hibernate. So the solitary woodchuck obviously hibernates solitary. Those ones, they can hibernate alone or with their pups, and those ones are obligate of hibernators with family. Uh, so it seems that uh, the lifestyle is kind of important, and uh, this is what we saw with the helpers, and we have seen that the helpers can buffer against adverse winter conditions. So if you have uh, good uh, winter with a lot of snow and okay uh, not so early spring uh, basically you have a positive effect with a lot of pups a lot of helpers and a population that is growing but if you come uh, to a winter with few snow okay a nice spring but not enough to compensate the few snow then you have a negative effect which leads to few pups and few helpers, and your population is declining. So it seems that uh, the disruption of the social structure uh, due to both the lower survival and uh, the lower number of helpers, uh, of pups that we have at the moment, and that is uh, caused by the change uh, in uh, the climate environment, uh, may cause the marmots to uh, enter a vicious cycle where the effect of uh, climate change will be amplified by the, the effect that they produce on the social structure of the marmots, which is a very critical determinant of uh, their hibernation. 
So uh, I'm finished and I have to thank all the people that have been working on the marmots and this is only a few of them. But uh, obviously the people that had been working with me and that are co-author of most of the work I have presented today. So I have a special thanks to the PhD students Celia and Marion that has done a very very good job. And uh, of course many many thanks to all the people that have been running to in the field. And that is mostly my postdocs, my PhD students, volunteers, and uh, and yeah, friends, and everybody that can help actually. And they have done a very amazing job, and they know what is a harsh climate, <laughs> can believe me. <laughs> and they have been working anyway. And thanks to all of you for your attention. So, if you have some questions. Okay, that's okay, that's fine yeah, also. So, so, <laughs> simple question, I think. So, the other species in the Rockies, uh, in the States, so, uh, what data, I mean, who collected the data? So, uh, yeah, in the, no, no, it's another team that is working in the Rockies, so the study in the Rockies is now going for more than 50 years. Uh, the first one that has collected data on them is Ken Armitage. And now it's Dan Blumstein that is working on them, and they have been uh, collecting data every year using more or less the same protocol that we are using in the yeah, La Sassière. The question, yeah, they, they, they do have uh, very similar data because they are also conducting some capture, mark recapture, uh, and they have the chance to work on an American species, which means that mm -hmm. it's easier to capture than mm -hmm. these European guys that are so shy and so annoying. And they also collect a lot of behavioral observation on the marmots. So they have really, really good data. Plus they have really good climatic data because there was one guy which started as a hobby to collect every kind of climatic data on the site where they are working. And now it's kind of a famous star in the US mm -hmm. for having doing that. <laughs> yeah, that's nice to have that same kind of uh, sampling protocol. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really nice to have a very uh, like uh, kind of similar uh, protocol, and also to have these species that are so similar mm -hmm. in some respect. So they live in very very similar environment, alpine environment, even if there is some difference, and they have evolved very different uh, social system, which is kind of uh, quite amazing and good chance highly related to the climatic condition that they face, and not since the last uh, fifty years since. Uh, millions of years. And um, no, so that, that was good. <laughs> yeah, that um, good to know. And uh, another thing is that I've seen a uh, whistle whistling moments somewhere. And then so when they whistle, I don't think they're really um, warning like other the, the, the rest of the family, but are they still warning by whistling or because of the type of just a different species that they have different way of whistling and calling? Yeah, so uh, first, yeah, we used to use the term whistling for the marmot, but actually it's not whistle, it's a barking. So oh. they're from a, an um, anatomical point of view, they do bark mm -hmm. and they do it and it's really to advertise the other. So it could be, um, most of the time it's related to predator or to any threat that they will have and this is going for, we have 14 different species of marmots all in the hemisphere. They have different kind of barking but they all use it to warn the other and this is also to, if you have uh, some, uh, especially the pups that are missing uh, in the evening, you may hear like marmots barking for minutes and minutes and minutes and it seems to be related to calling the one that are missing in the groups especially in the alpine marmot that is very social. So it's a nice, to way, nice way to say barking, barking yeah. whistling. Yeah. Okay. Be because whistling from who here it looked like a whistle, yeah. but from an anatomic, anatomical point of view it's really a bark. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the marmot, uh, she's not doing the whistling thing at all. She usually okay. opened the mouth and bark. Yeah, it's interesting. 
sometimes I, you know, I felt that someone was like uh, whistling, the, you know, whistle, the whistles, the, uh -uh. the backpack, yeah. and then I thought that was some emergency, then somebody, we looked around, someone was actually asking. Yeah, and I actually... I really realize it's quite regular, and a very similar whistle all the time, so that we realize that it more, more much, well, yeah, and the thing is that also, if you are here a lot, when they are, there is a straight uh, a threat that is not that immediate and it's just like some kind of info to give to everybody, they will whistling a lot of time. Mm. Like, but if it's a real threat, then you have this huge like emergency whistling just once and then done. Yeah. Mm. 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 Yeah, I have a question. So you said that in the Alps, uh, the population is doing worse and worse, mm -hmm. global warming. And, um, and here in the Pyrenees, we have the climate that you may have in the Alps in 20, in 20 or years. years, in yeah. Peter or something like that. So how would you explain that uh, our marmots are doing, uh, well, we don't know how they are doing. Yeah, we don't know uh, first. Uh, <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> um, but what do you think that's counterbalancing this effect of uh, I think if if we look also at the at, uh, all nice uh, rocky guys, one thing that we may come to is that at one point we have this big green stuff, and maybe it's what we you have in the Pyrenees. Like at one point, okay, uh, for no, what is bad for the marmot is having this low snow cover, and still it's really cold outside. For a marmot, if you go in tin in winter, it's minus 15. You are kind of naked in minus 15. That's not good for anybody. But we can perfectly imagine that to some point the temperature rise so much that then it's not that bad to have uh, no snow, but it's really good to have the earlier spring. So and do you think that it could be both effects? Like yeah. Temperatures are not low enough to create this? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's really, first it's really kind of, you have to consider this effect not to be linear most of the time, and you can quite raise some threshold and then doesn't matter. And you can also have compensation by one by the other, and at the moment with the marmots we are here, but the, in, in with all marmots, but in the Rockies actually they were there, and I say they were there, because actually now they start to have exactly what we have us. And they have that because not because of having less snow, but what happened in the Rockies at the moment is that they had uh, quite a bunch of years where they have these sand uh, storms. And the sand, uh, it's this red sand, it's uh, coming from uh, Nevada, I think. And it's, uh, it's putting sand all over the snow. And when the snow is covered by the sand, it melts super rapidly. And for the marmots, uh, it's bad. And actually their population at the moment is completely crashing. So this is, you, you have some transitory regime and that's uh, why it's probably so hard to predict also what's gone, what is going to happen. Plus, possibly adaptation at one point. But, uh, relating to this issue of the snow death, have you thought about why less snow is, is producing less snow? Off spring, is this yeah, because it's really like having a blanket for them. Uh -huh. Like, yeah, and the thing is that you have this, uh, you have your burrow, but you have the nice blanket over it, like, or your insulation layer on under your roof. And with less snow, you have less of this insulation layer, and then the hibernacula get really cold because you don't have this. Uh, and what we know also is that the marmots, if uh, the temperature in the hibernacula is around four degrees then this is okay. They don't use uh, energy, it's fine. It's like uh, they hibernate and nothing happens. But if you go below this four degree, the marmots has to keep their temperature to four degrees. And then it's enormous amount of energy consumption to uh, stay at these four degrees. And this what we think is happening because we also put like some logger in the burrow and we see a lot of fluctuation. Most of the time it really surprised the people because they say, okay, one meter, uh, 70 centimeters, it's the same. You are isolated anyway. Mm -hmm. But when we look at the data of the, of the burrow, it's moved quite a lot, even with the layer of snow and even with a quite big layer of snow.
<laughs> you have one question since it is. So. I'm, co I'm quite surprised with the result, with the comparison between the different uh, society systems, yeah. society baby, because it seems that the, uh, the most organized, the, the most evolved is the, the group that are more social, they will do worse with climate change. Yeah. I respect the opposite. Yeah, uh, yep. The thing is that uh, there is a lot of theory regarding evolution of sociality. And one uh, of these theories claim that uh, you're social because you don't really have the, cho the choice. It's because you are already facing difficult conditions, and the only way to face this difficult condition is to be social. And uh, here we have already difficult condition, but we put some extra more difficult condition on the social species. And this obviously uh, changed quite a lot of things and could be very costly for the marmots. And there is some result that I have not, that I have not presented here, but uh, we kept working on these things and especially on the cost and benefit of being a cooperative breeder uh, and the cost and benefits for the breeder and for the helpers. And what we see actually in the population is that uh, we have uh, less um, juveniles and they survive less, but we also have some change in the strategy the helper use. So before they stay in the groups and they help, but no, what they do, they tend to disperse earlier and try on their own. So we have more and more very small group that are not al always very successful, but that try to establish themselves as independent breeder instead of staying helpers. So there, are, there is some stuff here going in on with the cost and benefits of uh, this uh, kind of strategy, which is obviously not the case for the yellow-bellied, which is not social anyway. She's social, but not to this point. <laughs> Dan will kill me if I do that. <laughs> uh, talking about social organization, uh, the Arctic marmot can be considered as a eusocial species, or there is a difference between eusocial and can be social? Uh, yeah, uh, so a social is really like the very, very end of the sociality continuum. So it's very extreme species. So you will have co people, when they talk about cooperative uh, species, quite a lot of time they will encompass the cooperative bre breeder, census stricto, like the alpine marmot and the eosocial species. But one thing that is really different with the eosocial uh, species is that you have this kind of caste with individual w that will change in morphology and will be assigned to one task and quite difficult to reverse. Also, no, we know that sometimes you can reverse the things and make them change of categories. But with those guys, they usually during their life being helpers and then breeders, which is not the case with the social. With the social, most of the time, the breeder is the breeder and will be the breeder. And the soldier is a soldier and will be a sol soldier. And that's all. And, um, questions about the biology of the species. How much uh, offspring do they have, the, the pair? Uh, the pair, uh, pair year, they can have one to seven. Yeah, and actually the average is zero point, uh, it's 3.5, but yeah, one to seven. And uh, all of them uh, remain as helpers or now you, you commented on sometimes they go out and establish by themselves, but how is that organized? Uh, how do they know uh, how to remain or how to go out? <laughs> That's a big question. So what we know is that first, uh, in the alpine marmots, they at least stay until uh, their second birthday. Because uh, before they are anyway too small and um, they are not sexually mature yet. So there is this long time before being so socially mature. Uh, within this time, they cannot decide to disperse, or if they do, usually they don't decide that. It's somebody that puts them out of their family and they usually die. So they have to reach a critical mass first to be able to 
to, to live. And we know that uh, some of the determinants of uh, dispersion, not what make, will make an individual decide to disperse, is this body mass and also quite often the relativeness that it will have with the dominant pair. For example, if you have a change in the dominant of the same sex, then the dominant of the same sex will push the, help and the young out, or they will decide also by themselves to leave the group and try to establish themselves as a new breeder. Other thing that could be important is having the opportunity to establish yourself. Uh, so if you look at the at, at La Sassière, you see all these territory are really, really packed. So if you want to establish yourself as a new breeder, at least when it was in the 90s, the only chance that you had is to go fight somebody and take his place and become a dominant. Now what we see uh, when we have like new groups that appear, which was really, really rare. During uh, 20 years, we never saw a single group appearing, but within the five last year, we suddenly saw new groups appearing, which is like a new group, this is an event. But what we saw is that um, the group are smaller actually in size. And so what happened is, for example, a son or a, a daughter of the dominant will start to establish itself at the border of uh, the territory of their parents. And they will, and the other one, they are okay. They let them do that before they did not let them do that. But now they let them do that and they start their own family and grow. And then you have two territories that after some year are established here. But this is probably due to the fact that the family are smaller and the initial parents' dominance are okay with having a smaller territory and keep their offspring in the garden somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually compensate. Uh, we did some new uh, demographic analysis, which are too new for being presented here. But uh, yeah, it compensates some of the, this new strategy compensates some of the negative effect that we have. Not fully, but it uh, has some uh, positive effect on the demography. I had a question along the lines of what Bernard was asking. Uh, have you studied uh, within the Alps uh, populations at different altitudes? No. And, okay. <laughs> no, we're gonna we start that actually. Is maybe but the, uh, the populations in the lower limit would have a social structure and. Uh, that is a bit different. Yeah, it's similar. what we also hope to see in the Pyrenees. Because mm -hmm. uh, what we also know that it's more like a, yeah storytelling of people being in the field. But uh, what we know in La Sassia is you rarely have another female that reproduces in a group, but it, it happened a couple of times, maybe three times. But these three times were always in the best territory, the one that had most resources. And then in those territory, the dominant female accepted that one of her daughter gave birth. So it's possible that in other uh, condition where you have lots of resources or things like that, you could have quite a lot of uh, difference in the social structure and the, the social organization and also the mating system of the species. And we also like uh, made a study with another of my postdoc on um, how climate change could affect extra pair paternity because those guys, they are monogamous, but the female tend to mate with guys that are passing by. And we have found that the change in the climate and especially the fact that the snow is melting earlier change also the, the rate of extra pair paternity. And when you have a snow, snow that is melting earlier uh, than before, you have more extra pair paternity. So the, the, this climatic effect, they could really affect lots, lots of different parame parameters that are driving a population. And some of the behavioral stuff, I think they are probably more plastic than other things. Maybe so it's for a product, I think that <laughs> Bernard and me... You have to... Thank <laughs> you.